I come from a restaurant background. I went to cooking school uh, a very long time ago, about three decades ago, I finished cooking school. And my, my goal was to open my own restaurant after cooking school, but obviously I needed some practical experience. So um, after I graduated from cooking school, I went to cooking school in New York State, and then I moved out west and I worked for uh, a, a number of chefs in restaurants up in the Napa Valley. So it's a huge wine country and food area. So being a young, impressionable um, celebrity, you know, chef, gawker, you know, there were lots of those in that area. So I got to play around with great food, drink good wine, learn a lot about fun restaurants. Then about Five years after living in Napa Valley, my first husband and I decided to move closer to family. So we moved to Burlington, Vermont, which is on the other side of the country. And it's, I don't know if any of you have been to the, nor the Northeast section of the United States before, but um, it's really freaking cold most months. It's really cold. But I was like, okay, this feels good. It's a small town, you know, smallish town. It's not San Diego. And I was lucky enough to find a restaurant that had gone out of business and take over that restaurant, change the name. And I had my restaurant for 12 years there, which I love doing. But um, back to it's cold in Vermont. And I had grown up partially in San Diego. So I made my way back here and landed here about 11 years ago. And at that point, I'm getting older. I was born in 1967, so I'm getting older. And I noticed that things aren't like, don't work as well as you're getting older. And there's nothing you can really do. You are going to get, you're going to age. That's just inevitable, right? But I'm thinking, what can I do with my skill set um, to maybe mitigate those medications or, or stay out of the doctor's office? You know, what can I do with the food side of things? So I kind of switched my mentality from restaurant stuff, which was still working with nice ingredients and beautiful vegetables and meats and stuff like that to, um, I found this passion in learning and teaching uh, about healthy cooking, but in such a way that most people could, could relate to it. Because I think what happens a lot of times is people beat themselves up about their diets, right? Especially right after the holidays or right after a long weekend, they think they've overdone it on the sugar and on the maybe the alcohol and stuff, and they, they want to start this really stringent diet where they can't have sugar and caffeine and flour and beans and, you know, very restrictive. And the problem with those kinds of diets is they're, in, they're not sustainable. And so I've tried everything from like a vegan diet, which is no animal products, to plants, to um, diets that had a lot of restrictions. And I keep circling back to the best two things you can do for your overall health with eating is you can eat as many vegetables as you can get in your day, and you're gonna see this happen in this class today. And prepare most of your own meals, which in the COVID situation, we're kind of all doing that anyway, or most people I'm talking to are preparing most of their own meals as opposed to um, even takeout, I think is, is, is down from where it used to be. And it doesn't matter if you follow a, you know, if you're following a vegan diet or a vegetarian or keto is very popular right now, which, which is a lower carbohydrate diet. There's still room for a lot of vegetables. And I'm holding up this broccoli center stage here. Ooh, broccoli center stage. Um, unless there's a medical reason why you can't have something, I find that this sort of broad brush stroke on rules, meaning eat more vegetables, and get and prepare most of your meals you can it's almost universal for most people and so i don't i discovered that instead of teaching recipes where i stand in front of me and say and don't eat this and this is bad and this is terrible that's not really effective because it feels a little shameful when people tell say that to me also the way my person uh, my personality is is i'm like a type a minus in personality so I'm not really great at following something for a long period of time. So if you go on any of those really, really strict diet plans, so to speak, you know, by about day four, I'm kind of over it. So I teach from the standpoint of eat more of this and more of this are vegetables and meals that you prepare yourselves. And I think if you take your plate right here, here's your plate and you get as many vegetables on it as you can. And then you have some protein and some sort of healthy fat, which are things like avocados and nuts and maybe the yolks of eggs and maybe a little bit of carbohydrate, carbohydrate with fiber or white rice or something. If you build most of your plates like that, the rest is probably all going to fall into place for you. And where people get in trouble is they skip meals, they get really hungry 
and then they do a deep dive into like the potato chips and ice cream at nine o'clock at night. I mean, we've all been there, right? So I find from the fiber from the vegetables, really nutritious. And, and I just try to think about my plates every day or my smoothie, which I'm gonna demonstrate for you today. And so if I'm making breakfast and scrambling a couple of eggs, I might take some leftover roasted vegetables or quickly chop up some onions and peppers and saute them in. And just take that extra two seconds to get vegetables in there. So I have fiber, which keeps me full. I have protein and fat from those eggs, maybe even a little avocado. We've actually, for those of you who are oatmeal eaters, and I'll take a second and pause. Does anybody here eat oatmeal as on a regular basis? You can put it in the chat like, yes, you can raise your hand. Da -da -da. Okay, and your name, Cindy. I'm gonna talk, I'm gonna talk to Cindy right there, oatmeal eater, because I can see her front and center. Yeah, and if Rosie, I, Rosie's an oatmeal eater too, and I think Mary or Marie, Mary is also. And then iPhone 10. I can't see the name, but iPhone 10. I see you down there, and you are an oatmeal eater. Okay, so for the oatmeal eaters, you're like, okay, Les, Chef Leslie Myers, you are freaking crazy. There's no way I'm gonna put broccoli in my oatmeal. I know that's probably what you're thinking, right? Here's my solution. Now you can get this stuff called rice cauliflower at Costco. This one I think came from Home Foods, but Costco has plenty of it, Mom's has plenty of it. It's chopped up cauliflower, but it's been frozen. And when vegetables are frozen and then they're defrosted, they're actually soft. That freezing process, will they're not hard like this piece of raw broccoli. What you can do, Cindy, <laughs> I'm gonna pick on you, is you can take your oatmeal and using equal parts oats, to rice cauliflower and then cook it with maybe a little cinnamon and vanilla for taste. Um, you can incorporate that in whatever liquid you use to cook it in and this stuff incorporates really well and you'll never know you're eating cauliflower in your oatmeal. So that's my solution to the oatmeal eaters because I, you got it? Good. I saw the thumbs up on that. That's good. So that is, that is one thing to do and I realize that most times like you're not going to hit it out of the park every single plate and I get it. Um, I would say that that applies to most plates on most days or most meals on most days because you can't say, okay, Leslie said to eat vegetables, so for seven days straight, three meals a day, I'm gonna, I'm gonna hit that. If you miss a meal here and there, oh, it happens, you know? But if you can get that to 80%, you're doing a really good job by eating healthy. And the idea here is you follow that and maybe there's a way to convey that to your clients. And I know it can be difficult with some of the, um, especially I call my parents the vintage people. I don't refer to them as elderly because I, I think vintage is a little nicer, but they've been eating the same things. They get to about age 50 or 60 and they start eating the same things every day, and the same lunch every day and the same breakfast every day because it's easy. And so if you have a client that maybe for 30 years has had cream of tomato soup and saltine crackers for every lunch, sometimes it's a little difficult to get the idea of changing it up in. But what you could do for someone like that is you could actually sneak in a little bit of spinach that'll wilt down, you know, if you think they're not gonna get freaked out by the green stuff. Um, I'm also gonna teach smoothies, which are, you know, I told my mom last time she was here, I said, hey mom, <laughs> this is a strawberry and vanilla smoothie, do you want some? And she's like, oh, this is great. Oh, your father and I should make smoothies, you know? And then I told her what was in it afterwards. And I'm gonna save that punchline for when we get to the smoothie and go into it, but there were actually three vegetables in it but she thought it was a strawberry and vanilla smoothie. So I, there are creative ways you can do it. And Jennifer and the home care assistance team all see the value of, of teaching the caregiver some of these tricks, because we hope that if you can't apply them to your clients, you can at least apply them to yourselves and maybe you're gonna be healthier. And maybe that'll keep, you know, that, that'll keep things on a even keel for you. You'll feel better, your job will be better, you know. So we, we see a lot of value. And if you think about it, the one, one out of the two universal things that like almost everybody has to do in life is you have to feed yourself. Like you can't just skip that one day and be like, oh yeah, I'm not really into making food, so therefore I'm not gonna eat. Like somehow you have to feed yourself through the course of the day and the week. And it's funny because, you know, when we go to schools in America or colleges in America, like they teach a lot of esoteric things, but like the one thing everybody has to do is to feed themselves properly. And it's kind of a misstep that we actually don't, teach that anywhere you hopefully learned it along the way but it's not a priority and I think that you know the food that you put in your body is just the same thing as the gas you put in your car and think about it if you put really bad gas all the time in your car it's going to spew and stutter and start stall right 
when you put the right gas in, it just goes, and that's the same with food for the most part. And I know there are exceptions to this. I get it. I live in the real world, but I would just try it. You know, if you think of, take nothing else from this class, the goal would be to just get as many vegetables on your plate and don't overthink it. Don't be like, oh, I'm trying to do low carb and uh, carrots might have too many carbohydrates. Still has a lot of fiber, a lot of phytonutrients. And let's face it, like anytime you've ever like eaten a pint of ice cream in five minutes because you were stressed or you were hungry or you were tired, you're not going to overdo it on the carrots. Nobody's ever like had a bad day, gone home and ripped into a five pound bag of carrots and eat all the carrots. It just, it does, it doesn't happen, right? You don't like have a bad day and like, oh my gosh, I'm going to chow down six pieces of zucchini. Like you're probably not going to do that, but I would do that with Girl Scout cookies or ice cream or potato chips. <laughs> okay. Cindy's laughing. She likes my jokes. Yay. <laughs> and, and that's what I'd say about food. So like vegetables, like you really can't overdo them unless there's a medical reason, unless your doctor has had a talk with you about certain vegetables and they don't work for you for whatever reason, that would trump anything I say, because I'm a chef, I'm a foodie. Um, I talk about the nutritional value of food, but I am not a medical doctor. So listen to your medical doctor first. So with all that said, we're gonna start out by roasting broccoli. And I almost, I teach this in almost every home care class. And you know, here's why, because I have, I'm married to this guy named Jeff and he's not here right now, so I can just rail on him. <laughs> and Jeff thinks like bacon and ketchup are two of the four food groups. And so what I try to do is make healthy things and then he's my tester. If I can feed this to Jeff and he's like, wow, I like that roasted broccoli. Can you make me more? I know that I can feed this to most people. You know, he's like your standard American eater. So he's probably like off at Jersey Mike's getting a sandwich right now, even though we have a refrigerator full of food. Like he's, he's like, he, he actually had to go to his office today. So he's probably taking a side trip, I guarantee you, or in an out burger. But that's okay, do it once in a while, you know? But just make, try to get in the habit of making things like this at home. So with that said, all you need is your oven up to 425 degrees. Mo when you cook most things in your oven, that oven temperature is typically 350. Mo like that's, if, if I said put an oven on, I, my default would be 350. But for roasting vegetables, you want it higher. Why is that? Well, the, the tasty part of roasted vegetables is when those natural sugars caramelize in the vegetables. So even broccoli has a little bit of sugar. So the way we're going to make that happen is I pop my oven up to 425. And then I usually, I keep gloves right below my knife, my utensil drawer. And I always will put on gloves when I'm tossing things together or like putting chicken in marinade or something like that. So I am going to add some olive oil. The more oil you put on, the crispier it is, but don't fear the fat. You know, I was a young adult in the late 80s and 90s, and that's when the fat was the demonized macronutrient. I don't know if any of you remember that. You can type it in the chat. Oh yes, I remember that. But it was fat-free yogurt and fat-free cookies and snack wells, and as long as it didn't have fat, it was good for you. <laughs> and thankfully, um, that proved out to be false. And the science has come around and now we're including fat in our diet again. And I also was probably the most unhealthiest back in my twenties when I was eating like, I can eat a whole French baguette because it didn't have any fat. <laughs> but actually that's really not the best thing for you is a whole loaf of white bread in a sitting or plates of pasta. So fat is on this, it's okay. It will keep you full. It's good for your skin. It's good for your hair. You know, but I'm gonna appeal to your vanity too, right? Any of you? You know, vegetables and healthy fats will trump any skin cream out there. So the days that I've eaten like crap, and those days happen, um, you know, go in, have half a pizza, some beer, some ice cream, wake up the next day, you can see it in the skin. I mean, skin's your biggest organ, right? It's wrinkly, all this. I have a couple of days where I'm eating vegetables and I'm hydrated and all that. And I'm like, oh, wow, my skin cream must be working. No, that's the food working right there. So you can usually tell on someone's face what's going on internally. So there, I'm appealing to anybody's vanity out there. So if you don't like vegetables, think, oh, but I might not have wrinkles if I eat those. Okay, cool. All right, so olive oil. I'm just going to massage this around. And all I did is I took a, a baking sheet and I just put some foil on it. And that way, um, I'm lazy. I don't want to wash this pan. I don't feel like washing it. So the foil, <laughs> I put it up on the sides and that way I don't have to wash the pan after this. Okay, that is coated with oil and now a little salt. Unless you have clients or you that are salt sensitive, um, my parents are really funny right now. They're cracking me up. 
should they watch me do this? And my mother's kind of passive aggressive and she'll say, you know what, Leslie, when do you and Jeff think you might not, you're gonna start to not use as much salt? That's how she delivers it to me. I'm like, oh my gosh. And um, I'm like, mom, there is less salt on this than there is from your lunch today. She goes, what did I have for lunch today? I'm like, don't you remember? You went to Costco and I had a hot dog. And she's like, well, those aren't, it's not the same thing. And what I'm telling you is when you add salt to your food, like the way I just did, um, if I were going to equal the amount of sodium in a Costco hot dog, this would be too salty in taste for almost everybody. So I think, I think a little salt right on top of this low sodium product is great. And then what I'm going to do is pop this in the oven for about 25 minutes. So this is my home oven. Take a little ride in there. Are there any questions regarding the preparation of that? So a couple things I would tell you is that you want to make sure, um, you want to make sure that, uh, your vegetables are dry because if they're wet, they'll steam as opposed to get caramelized on top. So sometimes I'll use, I'll demonstrate with like a baby bag, a bag of baby carrots. And they're really, there's a lot of water in those for whatever reason. I don't know. They must keep them in like a tank <laughs> and then like open up the valves and like fill the bags. Um, just dry those off before they go on the flail. So in true cooking class form, you know, this is going to be like the Food Network. Like, oh my gosh, they're done. It's 25 minutes to pass. Okay, I made these earlier. So this is what I end up with. I'm going to eat this for you. Hopefully you can hear the crunch. But I end up with this really nice broccoli. Crunchy, flavorful. And this is what I say has passed the Jeff test. So Jeff will eat this. And he often will eat it with hummus. We've also had caregivers in our classes. Um, we used to teach them in person. Who will sort of, will be sitting in the class and a couple of them are a little reticent to be there and their arms will be crossed and they're kind of looking at me, you know, I'm reading the body language and they're saying basically, I don't like broccoli or I don't like carrots. And then we do this method of preparation and you end up with a really nice plate of roasted broccoli and they say, oh my gosh, I actually really like this. And I said, well, how did you eat broccoli in the past? And they're saying like steamed or boiled. I'm like, yeah, this is so much more flavorful. And I also think it works really well for your clients because you could make a whole pan of that or even two pans and you could feed them some at dinner and then you could scramble some with some eggs the next morning if you think they might be open to that. Um, I probably, at the end of this class, I'm just gonna sit here and eat this. <laughs> I, I, I won, really wants to taste it. <laughs> Will you come, come on over. <laughs> Let's do a drive while Frisbee it out on the driveway, true COVID form. Actually, one of my friends, we decided a few nights ago to cook, well, this was like a few weeks ago, I should say, to do some like classic steak and Bernays sauce, just super classic. And one of my friends was coming up to this area for uh, another reason. And he, he just texted, what are you doing? I said, we're cooking steak and Bernays. And he said, you know, pause, really? And I said, well, I have an extra one, just come by. So basically he like slowed down to five miles an hour and just kind of like handed him a whole to-go box of steak and Bernays sauce. So yeah. So there's your vegetables. So the, the magnet formula for this is um, 425 degrees. It's about eight cups of vegetables if you measured them out. Like if you're in a pinch, just buy the bag already cut into florets, cauliflower, broccoli, um, Brussels sprouts cut in half, and olive oil, salt, and it's about 30 minutes give or take. It sort of depends on the vegetable. And also if you're pulling it from your refrigerator or if it's already out on your counter, that makes a little bit of a difference. Okay. More vegetables. This has nothing to do with this class, but last class <laughs> I was teaching, we did vegetables on a skewer. And you know, I'm a visual person. And I know if Jennifer Muscat is on this call too, she's a visual person. And so I just took skewers and I just did pieces of zucchini and bell peppers and tomatoes and red onions, grill. And then we drizzled some pesto over the top, super easy and pretty. And I just wanted to show you that. So now what we're going to do is we're going to, I'm going to teach you how to cook a perfect chicken breast. And what I recommend doing for your clients or even you or your family is if you feel that they're open-minded to having food cooked for multiple meals, this is a time saver. So what you can do is cook two or three chicken breasts 
and you could serve them one for that meal tonight or half of one. Then you can take half of the other one and mix it in with a little like full fat Greek yogurt or maybe there's a mayonnaise they like and some chopped celery and you have a, a chicken salad the next day. Easy to do. So I always try to think of like ways to get myself ahead so I'm not recreating the wheel on every meal. Well, that rhymed, didn't it? That was like, that was a, like, a, what is it called? A, not a hymn, a poem, <laughs> a poem, a rhyme. Okay, so I have my burner going. It's a little loud, I apologize. I'll try to speak over it. A little olive oil in the pan or coconut oil or cooking, whatever you use for cooking oil. This actually is a nonstick pan, but as I, as I told you just a little bit earlier, I'm not, I'm not fearful of getting fat in my diet. That's a good fat to do. And chicken doesn't really absorb most of it. And it just helps with the browning. So why am I doing, I have my oven now at 350 degrees, hypothetically, it's the same oven. And what I'm going to do is brown this chicken for a couple of minutes. Why? Because it tastes better. Brown food tastes better than beige food. It really does. So if I didn't want that browning and that flavor from browning the meat, I could just put a chicken breast right in the oven. But what this does is it gives it some color and some flavor and it speeds up the cooking process. But I'm not going to cook it start to finish in this pan. I'm going to move this whole pan over to the oven because that indirect heat will keep the, will keep the chicken from getting dry. So here we go. Sizzle, sizzle, browning. And what I might do while it's sitting in the pan is I'm just going to season one side with salt and pepper. And I'm waiting till this gets up to like golden brown. So if you're a, if you're a dog person, that's like the color of a golden retriever. Sarah hears me say that every class. I'm a dog person. If you're a cat person, that's like a tabby cat. Would that be right, Sarah? A tabby cat? You're, you have cats. So it's like the brownish cat? I would say those are like the brownish ones. They got a lot of colors on them. We had a Siamese cat growing up. When I, or we didn't have it that long. We had a Siamese cat when I was six years old. And it was mean. It was really, really mean. And so I don't think it stayed in our family too long. Um, we rehomed it. But I don't think most cats are like Siamese cats, right? Most are like really nice and lovey and... So the rule on this is I've got my oven at 350 degrees. I'm getting some browning on one side for the flavor. Let me show that to you. See, tabby cat, right? Is that tabby cat? <laughs> browning. And then I'm gonna put it back and turn this burner off and put this whole pan into the oven for about 20 minutes. And what that does, the indirect heat from the oven cooks it in a way where it doesn't get dried because if I were just to cook this over direct heat, all the way start to finish that outside gets kind of tough and stringy and almost burned and sometimes it's raw in the middle so i'm using that indirect heat of the oven and that's how you make the perfect chicken breast so i'll be bringing that out soon i actually did one ahead of time it's already done i'll cut that for you so do you all have any questions and if you do, you can raise your hand, we can unmute you. And I don't mind answering any questions about anything related to what you eat in a day or something I'm not teaching. You're muted, Sarah. I'm muted. Oh, there you are, you're back now. Um, iPhone Queen has a question. Okay. Do you wanna unmute yourself or do you wanna just chat it and type it in? Or Gail, can you unmute her? Feel free to put it in the chat, you guys, if you have any questions for Chef Leslie. Yeah, or if she wants to be unmuted, Gail, if you can unmute her, I'll, I'll answer it that way. Okay. I think it's her. Hey, Sarah, do you know which one, uh, which caregiver had a question for us? It was iPhone Queen. iPhone Queen? Okay. Oh, yeah, I see. Yeah, she's, uh, she's muted on my gallery with the red hat, right? Yes. 
Hi, can you, we're gonna unmute you so you can ask your question. I'm just gonna go ahead and mute everyone for now. If that's, is that okay? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. I'm looking over here because I have the, I can see the gallery over here. So that's why I'm looking away from the screen, but you're still muted. Queen, make sure to unmute yourself. There you go. Oh, there you go. Hi, iPhone queen. What is your question with a red hat? I see you over here. What is your question? Oh, she might not have her audio on. Queen, make sure to put your audio on. We'll have her type it. We'll send her a note to have her type it in. Okay. Um, so that's okay. We'll get, we'll circle back to that. Okay. Sounds good. Any other questions? What do you all like to eat? <laughs> Vegetables. How many, so typical meals for care for people you care for. Any challenges? Are there any challenges you find when you're out in the field in terms of feeding people? Tina's iPhone, she is raising her hands. If you want to type in the chat or unmute yourself. Mm -hmm. Here's one. Er Elvira has a question. She's muted. All right. Elvira, make sure to unmute yourself. I unmuted you. <laughs> Elvira, I wish, sure I, wish I could read lips because I'd be really good at this. I know, right? Me too. Elvira, can you unmute yourself on your screen by any chance? Can you press? There you go. Okay. Hi. I say I like to cook and Good. I like to bake and I, I can cook very well. And uh, for me, I, if I, I don't know anything, I just go to Google and I, <laughs> I, find, my, I find my solution. Today I made onion soup, French onion soup and chicken enchiladas. I'm coming to your house. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to trade you some roasted broccoli for enchiladas. <laughs> you know, I like, that, I like that broccoli, but sometimes I don't like it because it takes too long to, to roast. And for me, I just cook it or steam it. Uh, yeah, steaming it, you can put little sauces on or, or sprinkle yeah. something on it. You put that, a little pepper, a little uh, butter in. Mm -hmm. yeah. No, that's good. I mean, the point about Google is really good because, you know, again, we haven't always had Google, right? It's, it's okay. relatively new to our lives. Okay. And um, the fact you can find any recipe videos, YouTube videos on how to do something. I mean, it really is changing a lot because when I went to cooking school, which was, I said, almost 30 years ago, you know, we had to learn in person from people. We didn't have that kind of access. And now you can do online cooking schools. Okay. I love so it. Hopefully we'll do more of this for the caregivers because I think it's really, I hopefully it's helpful for you all. You can nod if it is. If you think it's boring, just fall asleep. No, don't, don't no, do that. Not. And you know, all the time we, we learn something, you know, different ways to do that. And mm -hmm. uh, it, it's good. I like it. I like it. And uh, it's not boring because all the time there is something new. It's not boring. Good. It's good. good. I'm glad to hear that. Thank you for that feedback. And what also I'm curious about, because I asked this question in the, in the classes and we haven't had a class in three months, but what are some of the challenges that you all face when you're at a client's home and you need to feed them? What are some of those challenges? For my, I have some, some uh, uh, clients, uh, they don't eat uh, grease uh, or sugar or salt. And then you just follow the instruction they have because they, they have different um specialities uh or things difficult to eat but this right. i i just go i follow the, the the instruction and that's it do any of you find that you have people any of your clients that are nervous about having lots of food in the house at once like they just want a little bit of food in their house they don't like to buy in bulk like they don't like to buy big bags of things from costco do you ever find that no 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 okay. not in my okay. case they, they have everything over there. Or sometimes, you know, they have a, a relatives to bring the groceries or something. And they have, all the time, they have the special, the food, they like it. I don't have that kind of situation for, for myself. Okay, that's good. And we also hear we have people who have clients who are, don't chew well. Like they have problems chewing. I have one, one person mm -hmm. like that, but now he's okay. He's okay. And, yeah, it was like uh, one, two, three months, something like that, but uh, he came very well, little by little, and now he's, he's okay. But it was- oh, that's good to hear. 
fruit. And then we, we need to do the, the you know, blend the fruit, mm -hmm. or chocolate, very, very small, and very, and then he, he eat it. But it, it, it is just, for me, I like it because I do that all the time, you know. I just, I, I just follow the instructions. Yeah, no, that's really, that's really good feedback. Um, what I also wanted to say is the next recipe I'm going to teach you all is a smoothie. We teach these every class for that reason, because, because we find clients have a hard time chewing. Um, and Gail, correct me if I'm wrong, but historically, if, with the caregivers, if you go to a client's house and feel that they would be receptive to drinking smoothies and they do not have a blender, home care assistance will give you, you, you contact your care, your care coordinator and they will bring, get a blender over to the house. Yes, really. Some, mm -hmm. some houses, they don't have blended. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, and, and, and and Jennifer was adamant about that because she's really passionate about food as thy medicine. And she'd rather see, if your client's open to it, drink a smoothie as opposed to a can of Insure. Because if you, you know, Insure, like, it's very caloric. It's a good, you know, sometimes people just need to get calories and we totally get that. But if you read the ingredients, it, it reads like a chemistry project, right? <laughs> it doesn't sound like, it doesn't sound like food. Sometimes I can use it. And those more you put some vegetables, it's like a, you mix it all together and you don't, you don't know what is inside. Yeah, we're going to do that right now. Watch this trick. I'm going to grab my strawberries and my blender from the refrigerator. I'm very glad. Thank you. That's very good. Thank you, Havira. You're welcome. What's up? That's okay, we're with Any questions before I start on the smoothie with anybody? <laughs> no, I'm fine. Okay, so I've got just frozen strawberries. You can find frozen strawberries at any store. Like, so again, it's really important that we work with ingredients that are available everywhere and because people shop all different places. So we'll get, we'll get, I'm not gonna work with an ingredient that you can only find at the specialty market and nowhere else. So strawberries, right? Strawberries or raspberries, who doesn't like that? Now we're gonna sneak the vegetables in. So Cindy, this one's for you. That frozen cauliflower, I was saying, you can use florets for sure, but I just happen to have this open, this rice cauliflower. I'm adding some frozen cauliflower into this smoothie. So right here, and this is like, this This is neutral. This doesn't have any flavor to speak of when it's frozen. Um, cooked cauliflower, there's a smell to it. Cooked broccoli, there's a smell to it. Frozen stuff is, is like sw the country Switzerland, it's neutral. So bulk it up with a vegetable there. And because it's not green, it's not gonna give this smoothie a funky color. The next thing is, I often have zucchini hanging out. And the reason I have it hanging out is I make, I make zucchini noodles sometimes. So I sit here with my peeler, make some zucchini noodles, do, 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 do. And I'm, sit, I'm like, oh, look what I have left over. I have this inside of a zucchini because the inside is where all the seeds are, so it's hard. You can't make the noodles all the way through. So I stop. There's my plate of zucchini noodles. Put that aside for some pasta sauce. And what do you do with this? Well, I don't have my Labrador retriever anymore, so I can't feed. He used to eat everything. It was like a pet goat. You know, it's like, here, Labrador, eat that. My husky over there, he's really picky. My husband definitely won't eat it. So I just take some of that zucchini, and it goes in the smoothie. Again, if you taste zucchini, you taste raw zucchini, it doesn't have a lot of flavor. So let's put it in the smoothie. We want to keep the strawberry forward, right? Finally, one of the things I almost always have in the house is, is I have a head of red cabbage because I'll use some in salads. I'll make some coleslaw sometimes with it. And one home care class in February, three years ago, Jennifer and I were joking around and we're like, let's make everything red and pink because it's Valentine's Day. We're teaching about, so I was doing salmon. I had like tomato soup. I'm like, let's make this smoothie pink. And I had this cabbage and I just took a little bit of it and I put it in the smoothie. And you're like, ooh, I don't know if that's gonna work or not. But guess what? When it's all blended together, you can't taste it. Most people, including myself, and I'm pretty healthy, you know, to get through, trying to chew up cabbage with this raw is a little difficult. And if you have anybody that has a hard time chewing, forget it. That's not going to be the, what you're going to give them, right? But you put it in a smoothie. So now let's do the fun part. So I've got all these vegetables. So think about it. Three vegetables, zucchini, cauliflower, cabbage, cauliflower, cabbage, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, kale. They're all members of the cruciferous family. And why is that important? Cruciferous vegetables are said to have cancer fighting compounds to them. 
And you got to take that for what it's worth. It doesn't mean like you eat broccoli, therefore you won't get cancer. That's not always going to translate, but it's one little thing you can do to have better insurance against the possibility of getting a debilitating disease. You know, I, it, would be, it would be wrong for me to say, you eat broccoli, you won't get the cancer. That would be really wrong for me to say. But just try to add it in your diet. So, and then carbohydrates in here, healthy carbohydrates, because right now people are kind of like, I don't eat carbs. I'm like, no, you need some carbs. But these carbohydrates, we're strawberries, they have fiber. They're carbohydrates with fiber, and fiber is really good for you. <laughs> so think about any fruit, mostly is fine unless there's a reason if you have a diabetic client you obviously don't want to be giving them half a pineapple or three bananas you know that would be remiss but strawberries are low on the glycemic level i'm going to use a protein powder because i think you should get a little protein at every meal and it probably wouldn't work well to put like a raw chicken breast in here that would be weird right <laughs> I wouldn't do that. so i happen to have protein powder this is a whey protein powder it doesn't mean it's right or wrong it's just made from cow's milk protein but you could use a, a one that was made from pea proteins you know there are flax proteins hemp proteins or there's so many different kinds this is one I happen to like because it has a little vanilla flavor and I like vanilla. What I didn't tell you all is my first job out of cooking school and in Napa Valley, I worked as a pastry chef for two years. So I really like those good proper dessert flavors. So I almost always have vanilla extract hanging out in my house because I do a fair amount of baking. So I'm thinking smoothie, let's put it in, little vanilla extract. It's not required. You could use a little vanilla yogurt to get that vanilla too. I just happen to have it. Now, for those of you who do bake, you can raise your hands if you've ever made from scratch cookies or muffins or cakes or anything like that. I bet I, bet I have some people who do that. When you're baking and you're putting together, you know, let's go with a classic cake, cream the butter, add the sugar, mix it all together, add the eggs, and then we put in the dry ingredients. And those dry ingredients are flour and maybe baking soda or baking powder, right? Because the cake needs to rise. And always a pinch of what? Say it with me, Gallery. Sure. What's that pinch you put in? Salt. Pinch of salt. Pinch of salt, right? Yeah. Yeah, and why do you put salt in a baked good? That seems counterintuitive, but why would you do it? And what happens when you forget it? It sucks. <laughs> mm. you, you put it in because salt enhances flavor. And if you're making something like a, a, a cake made with butter and there's some chocolate in it, that salt is gonna bring out the flavors of the chocolate and the vanilla and the butter. If you like, leave it out for some reason, if you leave that salt out, you're going to taste that and be like, wow, there's something flat about that baked item. I don't know what's wrong with it. It's okay. It's okay for me to eat it, but there's something wrong. So it's really interesting. So I'm kind of like, unless you have a client who's really been told by the doctor, you know, no salt, no salt, I actually will put a little in my smoothie. And I'm talking a little, like right here. Mm -hmm. And that pops the flavor of the strawberries and the vanilla. It doesn't pop the flavor of the raw cabbage, funny enough, which is good. We don't want that flavor. Okay, so we got that going on. And um, I, I noticed you're taking notes. I can't catch your name, but <laughs> um, that's funny comment. I like that comment. But uh, Gabby can we, or Gail, can we um, email or can we get the cop recipe packet to everybody on the call today? Absolutely. Okay, these are all in it. Peanut butter. So I'm thinking mm -hmm. peanut butter and jelly. This is like, I know my parents eat a lot of this. Peanut butter and jelly was a very popular packed lunch sandwich. So I also told you all earlier, a little bit of fat in every meal, right? Peanut butter is a healthy fat. It is. So I'm going for a peanut butter and jelly flavor on this smoothie by adding the healthy fat, in this case being peanut butter. Somebody has a peanut butter allergy, a peanut allergy, a nut allergy, you could always leave that out, do something else, but that's what I have going on. Now, we want this to be sweet, almost like milkshake tasting, but I do get a lot of requests for diabetic friendly meals and smoothies. So my answer to that, instead of a traditional like extra ripe banana in here for the sweetness or some honey or just lots and lots of sweet fruit like pineapple, I'll grab stevia, which are the green packets at Starbucks or the coffee shops. And this is liquid stevia though. You can find this at Trader Joe's, Vons, um, Costco, every store has it. And I find for a smoothie, if you want it to get up to like milkshake normal level in sweetness, probably about eight drops of it. And it, it's, it's zero calories, it's a natural product, and it, take, it has that sweet flavor, but you're not putting saccharin or something like that in. 
And then finally, whatever liquid you want, obviously this isn't gonna blend well in some liquid, but because I have that protein powder, it's pretty creamy from that. I just use water. So this whole smoothie right here, even with the peanut butter in it, probably has about 250 calories. So it's like almost snack to light meal-ish. Does that make sense to everybody? Mm-hmm. Nod your heads. Yes. Now let's drink it. Hey, let's, let's make this a smoothie and drink it. Now, it's a real bummer I can't feed this to you, but this is why I was saying, Gail, we should have driveway smoothie sample day because I want to prove this. <laughs> I want to oh, prove that this recipe works. <laughs> well, let's blend it together. I'm going to pour it into a glass and you can do it on how beautiful it is. It helps if you turn the blender on and plug it in, typically. <laughs> okay, here we go. Okay, so this to me looks like a strawberry milkshake. Let's check it out in glass so you all can see it. Take a look here, pour it down. So you mm. don't see any green, crazy vegetables. It looks like mm -hmm. a strawberry creamy smoothie. The peanut butter gets integrated, so the flavor is there. This is really good. So there's your healthy three vegetable, carbohydrate with fiber, protein, fat, all in here. And for people who have a hard time chewing, these are great. So the recipe packet that we've done for home care has about seven or eight smoothie recipes in it. I always use frozen fruit because it's easy to work with. It has that ice component, so you're not trying to do fresh fruit and ice together. That gets a little more complicated. What do you think? You think you're gonna try it? Try making this? Yes. Oz, yes. Yes. Yay. So the last thing I was gonna talk about because I have a few more minutes is I'm gonna show you the chicken. Um, coming out of the oven, but I also just wanted to speak to eggs for a second. And how many of you cook eggs for your clients, or this is good, I'm looking at this comment, cook eggs for your clients or eat eggs yourself on any, with any sort of regularity, semi-regularity? Okay, good. You see that in the gallery. So we were just talking about um, different things you can buy, but like if you, do you know Sean, do you know Sean down at the office? So you all met him? Um, so he has chickens in his place in North Park of all places. Like he has a pretty small, but he has a couple of chickens. So he used to bring us eggs in. And that's great if you have somebody like that has, I don't like birds, so I don't have chickens and I can't have them. I don't, I don't have space to have chickens, but make friends with somebody who has chickens. <laughs> um, if, but if not, I try to buy sort of the highest quality egg I can. Um, you know, Walmart and Target and most grocery stores are carrying this brand. And I'm not married to a brand, I'm not paid by any brand. But the reason I brought this out is it's pasture raised. It means that these chickens have run around a garden or a plot of land and eaten grass and slugs and bugs. They're not like in some sort of chicken um, lot getting fed corn pellets. So why is that important? Like, what does that mean? Why that's important is um, because they're eating their indigenous diet, they're, the nutrients of those eggs are, hot, are higher. So you'll know the first thing you'll notice is the shells are harder, and that's the that's a giveaway. You can tell how healthy chickens are, and the eggs by how hard the shells are. So if you have a shell that's like tissue paper, which some of them are, the chickens probably didn't have a very good quality of life or quality of diet. Um, when the yolks are usually more yellow, and the beta carotene and the choline. And the omega-3 fatty acids are all about from 30 to 50% higher and the cholesterol is lower in these eggs. So, and I know some people are kind of like, well, they're a couple bucks more expensive and that's all true, but you know what? It's a health dollar for me, not a food dollar. And so I try to when I can, and that makes sense to me because still if you take a dozen eggs and you figure two eggs per serving, that's six servings of high quality protein with some fat that still works out to like $1.50 a serving. Like that's not bad, you know? I mean, and so that would be my recommendation. And, and again, I don't work for this brand, but I like to highlight it. And what we did for fun is, with 4th of July being right around the corner, we made deviled eggs. 
for these. So this is what we did. And all I did was um, hard boil the eggs, peel them, and then took the yolks, took a little um, Greek it's yogurt as well instead right. of mayonnaise. Mm -hmm. Greek yogurt is pretty high in protein if you have somebody you have dairy. Yeah, yes. And then we, we put in a little bit of mustard. Um, that was it, salt and pepper. And there you go, a little smoked paprika and chive on top. So we have some deviled eggs. And this is something, um, I went on my own Instagram account and posted a picture of a different batch of deviled eggs yesterday. And I got more comments on that. I think people just really like deviled eggs. And here's what my husband pointed out, because he's kind of a smart, he's like a know-it-all. I call him Noe McNo sometimes. Um, most people won't sit down to an, like make four eggs and scramble them, right? That's a lot for a breakfast of eggs. You probably aren't eating four eggs in the city. But people, if they see a bunch of deviled eggs out, will eat eight pieces of them, like without even thinking about it. It's kind of funny. But it's still a high quality snack. So even if you are someone who is looking for a good snack, I often will boil extra and then I put them in my fridge, but label them because people get confused about which ones are cooked and which ones aren't. I put an H on them for hard boiled. And this is a 70 calorie snack and the shelf life on these is a couple weeks once they're cooked. So um, that is a really good healthy snack. Now let me grab the chicken breast out of the oven. Here we are. Okay, looks fine. And what I'm going to do is slice it and show you how moist it is. Everyone's commenting now how much they love smoothies. You love smoothies? Yes, everyone's excited about your smoothies. Love Great. Them. We have so many of them. We actually did one that was really fun. We did, if you like coffee, we did one with frozen cauliflower and coffee. <laughs> and mm. Powder and it actually tasted like a coffee milkshake, like it was pretty good. So, like, oh, that's interesting. I mean, you could use cold leftover coffee. There's just like in the blender, we'll just you know blend it all up, it's easy. So, this is what we have going on here with the chicken perfectly cooked 20 minutes in the oven, 350. I'm using my spoon so I don't burn my hand because it's pretty hot. So, when this off, let me show it to you. And there's your perfectly cooked chicken breast right here. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, come on over. So we have deviled <laughs> eggs on the menu. We have chicken. We have broccoli. I have some zucchini noodles. Yeah, um, I have noodles. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and the whole, everything here is really budget friendly too. Like it's it's good, healthy, whole food. And I always tell people like you're much better working with food that has one ingredient. So eggs have one ingredient. Eggs, chicken. There's chicken. It's not a whole bunch of things. Like you you pull out like a bottle of dressing and you start reading through it and you're like sodium di, di what and you know monosodium glutamate and you're like this isn't even food I have none of this stuff in my pantry or in my refrigerator so as much as you can I, I mean of course you gotta just don't try to be perfect with it because nobody is you know be mindful I always say be mindful but don't be militant about trying to get every meal to be perfect but just put that in your head when you're sitting around thinking about food, which is what I do all the time, is how can I just get a little extra something in there, mainly vegetables, that's healthy. So that is our, our fun class for today. Um, we have a little time for questions. If you want to ask questions, thank you for the applause. Yeah. yeah, talking about eggs, what of egg gland best? Is it egg? It... So which, which brand is best? Not that, even a brand, but- Egg gland, egg gland, uh... It, no, pasta. No, not that one. The one that can... Sometimes they say organic. Sometimes they say, um, uh, what else have I seen? Vegetarian fed, which is kind of a BS thing because chickens aren't vegetarian. So that's not really a selling point to me. So um, cage free is another one. It means the chickens have more room to roam around. Because in this country, which is kind of, it's, it's a real problem. We don't have the same regulations that other countries have about how food is produced and raised. There's a lot of, you can mm. do a lot of um, not so good things with food mm. for the sake of economy. And unfortunately, our food has more pesticides in it, herbicides. Um, whether it's organic or not, it doesn't really matter. I mean, I'd rather see you just eat, you know, whole foods. But eggs, um, I would just try to find the pasture raised and they're like, again, Walmart, Target, Trader Joe's, they all have it. And those chicks, they're, they're going to be better for you. Okay. Does that help? Okay. Any yeah. other questions? Thank you. For your chicken. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, that concludes our, our lesson today. Um, I think Gail's going to send you the recipe packet where all these are in. Um, that would be nice. Yeah. Excuse and then me. Hopefully, at some point, we can figure out a way to have you taste some of these things. At, because I would love for you to sort of, I think that's the best way really to get the message across is when you taste it and say, oh my gosh, that actually works, you know? Send it through drone. <laughs> What's that? Oh, drone? Yeah, let me get my drone. <laughs> That'll be the next thing. Okay, well, thank you everybody Hello. for coming today. Uh, <laughs> it was so much fun. Thank you, Leslie. Yeah, thank You're you. You're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, I'll wave goodbye. If you have any questions, don't forget to reach out to me through Gail. Yes. Okay, bye. Hey everyone, thank you for coming. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.